Okay, and I think we're live. Hopefully we're live. Welcome along to the little live broadcast here. If you can see and hear us, let us know. That would be fantastic because I don't know at the moment how we're doing. I like this. This is quite exciting. Um, so whilst we're getting everything set up and a few people are still joining us in the room, uh, I'll do a little introduction for those that don't know me. Hello. My name's Gavin Hoey. I'm a full-time professional photographer, photographic educator. I'm an ambassador for Olympus cameras, but that doesn't really matter because I'm also an ambassador for Calibrite, which is being brought to you by this, this little webinar and BenQ are helping along as well. So thank you very much for their support, but mostly thank you guys for, for being with me. Now, I've got some glasses because I'm getting old. I'm gonna have a quick look in here just to see if I can see anything popping into the chat questions or comments. I'm going to guess no news is good news. Uh, I'm not on my own. I mean, I am kind of on my own, but way over there, you can't see her and you can't hear her, but there's Sam. Give me a wave, Sam. Give us a shout. If, you, if I shout, everyone will hear. Fantastic. Are we, are we live? Can you see me? I can see you. Whoa, brilliant. Okay. That's always the biggest thing when you're going live is, uh, is it actually working? Anyway, we're good. So thank you for joining me this evening. And uh, wherever you're joining me in from the world, it's, it's really great to have you along. What am I going to be talking about for the next 45 minutes is a very good question. Luckily, I do have a plan. It'll surprise you as this goes along, but there is a vague plan to this because tonight I'm talking about capturing and controlling color. That's really the whole purpose of this. How do I control my colors? How do I capture it? from the, the pressing of the shutter through to the clicking of the mouse. That's kind of what I'm gonna take you through. And if we're really lucky, and if I'm feeling really brave, at the end, I will attempt to do a little bit of live photography. Don't get too excited though. We'll see how this goes. Let's just play it by ear and see how this goes. So uh, I need to press a few buttons. Bear with me. This is my first time using this particular piece of software. Uh, I think I need to press this button and then press that button and then press this button. Aha, okay. So yes, there we go. Hopefully you should now be able to see a screen. Now this is fun. I can't control what you see. So if you're watching this, uh, hello, you might still be able to see me. You might be able to see my screen. I think there's a little slider that lets you actually sort of slide between me and the screen. So you're producing this at your own end. That's that's really exciting. I'm going to look over at Sam. Yeah, so I can see your... You can see my screen? I can see you. A bit of me. A bit of a tiny I think that's best to keep me as a small me. Brilliant. Okay, so um, I'm going to run through a little bit of a, a sort of PowerPoint presentation, but don't panic. Trust me, we're going to get out of PowerPoint as soon as we can and uh, get into some real world editing. Uh, this is also interactive as well. So if you have a question, pop your questions in the question section in the chat. And uh, Sam is going to sort of monitor that a bit via the power of the wonderful Alex at Calibrite at the other end. There are multiple cogs whirring away to make this all happen. So uh, let's start with a little sort of introduction about me. For those that don't know me, I am a full-time professional photographer. I specialize in portrait photography and particularly portrait photography education. So that's where you may have come across me. If you have, brilliant. If you haven't, go check me out on YouTube. It's the best place to, to go find me. I work out of a small home studio. There it is. And around about six months ago, I thought it would be a brilliant idea. I say I thought, Sam thought it would be a brilliant idea to move. So we're no longer in my small home studio or the house or the garden that that was in. And my new small home studio looks like this, which I'll be honest with you, is a lot more pretty on the outside than the old studio. But on the inside, it's basically four white walls. So if you can see me on the little screen, the, the white walls, that's basically it. It's uh, it's a room. We just took everything out of the room. But that, that's my little studio now, which is lovely. It's got proper walls and heating. It's very nice. So that's where I work. What do I do is perhaps more interesting. So I love color in my images. And what I really should have called this talk isn't capturing and controlling color. I should have called it capturing and controlling reds. Because to be honest, I think I should just say red is my favorite color as far as my photography goes. 
So I do an awful lot of photography with red in it. This is a fairly obvious example, red fabric, model wearing a red dress. She even did her hair red for the session as well, which is over and above what you'd expect a model to do for you, bless. So thank you, Fern, that was brilliant. Uh, but red just seems to be a theme that runs through a lot of my images. So here we are, different model, different red dress, and a red hair again, that's coincidence. But again, a lot of strong reds coming through. This was a long exposure picture. This is two seconds exposure, where the model moved from the right-hand side of the frame to the left-hand side of the frame over those two seconds. And then there was a burst of flash at the end called second curtain sync, rear camera sync, just to freeze her like that. And again, I've gone to town with the reds in this image because I love red. It really is quite punchy and eye-catching. Bit up to date, this was Halloween. We love to do a Halloween photo shoot. And this was organized by Sam as a complete surprise. I had no idea what we were gonna shoot. We had the lovely Sophie in, and Sophie is a world-class makeup artist. She's done like Hollywood films, stuff like that, and a brilliant model. So she did her own makeup, her own modeling. They came up with a theme together. They didn't tell me what the theme was. Great fun, really enjoyed that shoot. And again, red. Lots and lots of red, lots of great colors in that shot. So you're going to see a few pictures of Sophie because she is a great model. I work with her a lot. And this was a fun shoot. So this is actually outside of my studio. And the little blurry bits of water are actually blurry bits of water. Those little spots, they are water from a, a hose pipe. So there's Sam behind with a hose pipe spraying water into the air, backlit with a flash. But can you see the red? I mean, the color is punchy. When we first did the shoot, um, Sophie was actually in a, a leather sort of jacket and it just didn't look quite right. So I sent her away and she came back with a red dress. Yay, well done, Sophie, perfect. And that really set it off beautifully. So again, color, red, punchy, really good. Of course, it's not all about punchy color. My photography also goes down the darker route quite often. And by dark, I mean low key. So low key is one of my favorite things to shoot because it's actually quite straightforward. You can do really low key images with minimal kit. It's actually quite easy to make your images dark. Um, quite often they come through dark by mistake, but this is deliberately dark. Now, the only downside with doing low key shots is that when you're streaming them on a live stream, they don't always stream so clearly. So you may or may not see some of the detail in that shot, but hopefully you can see skin tones. And when it comes to color, skin tones, really, really important. Because if your skin tones are off, you'll notice really quickly. And by off, I don't mean if they're a little bit warm or a little bit cold. We'll look at that later on in this little webinar. I mean, if they're a little bit green or a little bit magenta, our brains are sort of hardwired to spot that and it really shows. So getting colors right for portraits, absolutely vital. The flip side, the, the complete opposite would be this. So this is a high key image. This is really bright lots of light tones. In fact, I don't think there's a single black anywhere in that shot, looking at it. Nope, I can't see a single black in that at all. It's a color image, but with a very muted color palette. The colors that are there, absolutely vital. If I took away that and just had a black and white image, it would feel different. So the color on her lips, and by the way, this is Sophie again, same model, completely different look. The color on her lips absolutely makes a huge, huge difference. Sometimes I like to do very strong shifts in color. Technically, that's the wrong color, but that's exactly what I wanted. So that's actually the right color. That's exactly the right color. That's spot on for what I wanted. So that is a really warm tone image. And just one last image before we get into something a bit more interesting. That is the opposite. That is a cool tone image. And I'll show you how I get consistency with both my warm and cool tones in a little bit when we get to some editing. I'll show you exactly how I do it using some of the kit from, uh, well, <laughs> you'll see it on the, oh, you can't see my desk, can you? So from the, the Calibrite kit, I'll show you that in a little bit. We'll, we'll swap around. 
I forgot I haven't got control of all the cameras. This is fun. A uh, little behind the scenes, just to give you an idea. So this is a shoot that we did a couple of weeks ago. It is our Christmas shoot, so it hasn't been released yet. In fact, I haven't even edited it yet, to be honest. I really must get around to that. So um, this is how it was set up, which is a picture frame, a model behind it, and then the frosted effect. And the frosted effect was created using, oh, God, what was it? Epson. I was going to say Andrew's salts, but it was Epson salts, wasn't it? Epson salts. There'll be a whole video about it coming soon. That, and that was Sam's handiwork. Really great fun, looked amazing. Okay, so let's just, I'm just gonna dive very quickly into the, the chat questions and comments. If you have any comments, do stick them in. I would be, uh, I think I'm okay. Lovely, I can see we have, we still have people joining us, so that's really good. We're doing okay, I'm gonna keep going. Right, let me click here. Okay, oh yeah, this would be a good point to leave this on the screen. I knew I had a screen to put on whilst I was checking everything, damn it. So this is a, a little set of special offers. So if you're watching this, there is some special offers just for you guys, the 150 of you that are watching. There is a webinar special, which is 10% off uh, any of the calibrators from Calibrite and 5% off any of the SW monitors from BenQ. So thank you very much guys for uh, making those offers available. Uh, the same code, Gavin10, nice and easy to remember. And I'll stick that up again at the end. If I remember, Sam will remind me, I'm sure. I'll pop that up again at the end of the webinar. She's making notes now to re remind me. Uh, okay, let's move on. Oh, and I, I should have said, I forgot about that bit. It's only valid for a week, you've got a week. Okay, so uh, what do I control in my, my little color lineup to, to really get maximum control? Well, three things are at my disposal. I can control my monitor, my camera settings, and my editing. Now, those three things aren't, I was gonna say in order, but I, they're kind of in order, but they're not in priority order. So I will spend a lot more time getting things right in the editing. But if my monitor isn't right, that's a bit of a waste of time. And my camera, believe it or not, when it comes to color, is actually the bit I put least amount of effort into. I mean, by far the most amount of effort into everything else. But when it comes to the color, most of that happens after I click the shutter. You'll see why, we'll go through this and we'll, we'll see why. So what do I use as a monitor? So my main monitor, and I say main monitor because I have a, a triple monitor set up at my proper desk, which is in my little office. And my main monitor, the one that should be right here, and if it was, you wouldn't be able to see me, uh, is actually this one, this one right here. Uh, if, you, if you slide across, you, you'll see me, hello. Um, this is my little main monitor, I've dragged it out. Uh, and it is my trusty BenQ SW2700PT. So this is a monitor I've had, I'm trying to think when I got it, well, it was definitely before the pandemic. It's odd, isn't it, how you kind of like, everything before the pandemic, that's like a cutoff. Like, yeah, definitely. BC before COVID. B BC before COVID, Sam, Aye, that's good. Um, so yeah, it's definitely prior to that. I reckon I've had it four years. Don't quote me on that. What I know for sure is it's no longer the current model. There are better, I was gonna say bigger, they were bigger. There are bigger and better features uh, in the newer models. So if you wanna find out about that, head over to BenQ. Um, yeah, there are better monitors out there. But what I can tell you is my SW2700PT works today, in my eyes, as good as the day I bought it. There's the thing, isn't there, about buy cheap, buy twice. And that's a, a trap I've fallen into many, many times. I bet I'm not alone. That's not a cheap monitor, but it's a monitor that it, it survived the test of time and the test of travel. Because BC, before COVID, when we were out doing and events at uh, various camera um, uh, stores and bits and pieces, that's done with well traveled. Okay. Oh, let's have a little look. Uh, I have just a little pop-up message saying that uh, I have slow network connection. Okay, so apologies if I sound a little bit muffled. There's seems to be all right at my end. What's going on there? I, I'll keep going. Uh, what I'll do, I can save you a little bit of bandwidth by just switching off my webcam for a second. 
here we go because uh, you don't need to see me anyway it's look at the screen that's more important and that'll help a little bit possibly yeah, a little jumpy, a little jumpy? Yeah. yeah okay I can't hear. <laughs> we'll see how we go we sh you can still hear me i can still see that that's good okay so uh, details about this monitor it is a 27 inch monitor it is um Two, uh, what is that? 2560, 2560 by 1440 in resolution. That becomes important in a little bit. And it is 99% of Adobe RGB coverage. But here comes the, uh, the kind of the little bit of a kicker for me. That's not important. I really don't care about that. I'll explain why in a little bit. But I'm really interested in sRGB, 100% of sRGB color space. So that is important because the color space you use is going to make a difference to the monitor you choose, but also how your workflow progresses. So for me, that's absolutely vital because I don't use the Adobe RGB color space. I am 100% sRGB. So if anything I've just said made no sense to you whatsoever, here's a little kind of rundown. Oh, hello. Oh, oh, Sam's right in the hat. I thought you were. <laughs> okay, here's a little rundown to what I'm trying to explain. So here's a little graph. This little graph shows the Adobe RGB color space and the S RGB color space. The little triangles there. First thing to get out of the way, there is exactly the same number of colors in both color spaces. Adobe RGB, S RGB, the same number of colors but the spacing of the colors is broader on Adobe RGB. So you get a greater range across the same number, if that makes sense. And if you really wanna get into it, you can go bigger still, Pro Photo RGB, but as far as I know, there isn't a monitor that can display that. Maybe there is, but it's definitely not gonna be in my budget. So sRGB is a much more compact color space, and it is also the color space I use because everything I do, absolutely everything I do is online. So I am online only for uh, my videos, my tutorials, my blog posts, absolutely everything is online. I'm gonna just try turning my webcam back on again uh, as it seems to have sorted itself out. Here we go, yeah, you may see me. Okay, yeah, that seems to be fine again from my end. Uh, so everything I do is, um, it's based around online work. Years ago, we did do a uh, uh, an exhibit, an exhibit, an exhibit, exhibition. exhibition. <laughs> Can you tell it's live? <laughs> an exhibition of my prints, and it was brilliant. I loved it. I saw all my prints up on the wall, and it was the first time I'd had any of my prints printed because I just don't really print. And then I looked at them, and I thought, you know what? I am definitely an online photographer. Th those prints were great, but out of context, they didn't really work for me. Just, I didn't feel, they, they, so uh, yeah, I'm not a beautiful landscape photographer. That's, that's maybe the thing. Okay, that's fine. Uh, right, so um, blah, blah, blah. I'm, I'm keeping half an eye on the quality and it looks okay. So I'm gonna keep going. Yeah, good. So the other thing, of course, is if you put anything online, if you put it on, let's say Instagram, for example, or people look at your stuff on their phones, I mean, there are phones that do sRGB color space. I'm sure mine does. But then you go and fiddle with your settings. Phones are so wild and varied that you just cannot pick a color space and have any confidence that it'll look anything like what you see on your monitor. Just live with that. That's, that's life. Okay, so uh, calibration. Uh, I, I would say a poll, but we can't really do polls, but if you if you calibrate, let me know. If you're a, a color calibrator, let me know, stick it in the chat, be interesting to see. I calibrate reasonably regularly, okay? I don't have like a, I'm not a weekly or a daily calibrator. I calibrate with the Color Checker Display Pro and I do it when I feel I should. That's the best advice I can give you. I know there are photographers who swear blind that they calibrate every day, Fantastic. Uh, every week, yeah, every month is probably realistic. Uh, I'm not that person. 
my, my calibration is there for two reasons. So I calibrate my, my BenQ monitor because I want consistent colors. Okay, so I want my colors to look the same this month as last month. That, that's basically it. And I also want to get the best quality out of the piece of kit I paid for. And those are my two and only reasons for calibration. If I had clients and I was doing commercial work, that would be the third reason, that the commercial work that I did last month would look the same as this month. So if you're doing a, a red background, the red that you had for one client match the red for the next client who'd seen the previous ones and said, I want that. that. That's another reason for calibration. That doesn't happen in my world, but I can see that being a thing. Okay, brilliant. So um, yeah, back to the monitor. I was talking about the, the settings here and I was saying that there's a few reasons that I like the monitor and the resolution. So the monitor I've got, the SW2700 is not a 4K monitor. Now you might be thinking, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? Well, let's imagine that this sort of, what color are we gonna call that? Let's call that duck egg blue. No, cyan, <laughs> whatever color my screen has just gone. Let's just say that all of that is 4K. It's not, trust me, but let's pretend it is. By comparison, if I was to show you a full HD monitor, it would be this much space. So you can see how much more information a 4K monitor holds than a full HD monitor. Now my laptop is full HD. Um, you can see I would get four of my laptop screens, literally four of them to fill a 4K screen. That would mean I would need a graphics card capable of pushing that much more data. My uh, BenQ, is this size. It's bigger than full HD, it's smaller than 4K. And for me, that is a lovely comfort place. Did anyone hear that in the area? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay, so that is a nice comfortable place to be. Okay, so that's, that's kind of why I like to use this monitor. And out of interest, I have no idea whether GoToMeeting has an HD option. Um, I've looked through all the settings, I couldn't find one. Uh, if it is HD, let's say you're on Zoom, for example. If you're watching an HD little box on Zoom and you tick that box, what you're actually doing is using 1280 by 720. Okay, so HD is not full HD. There is a difference. So interestingly, if you're watching something in HD and you're looking at it on a 4K monitor, Look how much bigger it has to expand to fill the screen. That's worth bearing in mind. Why do my videos look blurry? Well, that could be a reason. But for me, the main reason is this. So this over here, if you look on your screen, is a screen grab. It's not real. That's a screen grab of my Photoshop, where I spend most of my time. And as I can see, uh, I can't, you know, I can see that. That's okay. It's not going to be great on your screen, but trust me, I can see that quite clearly and I can read it with my glasses on because I'm getting old and that's fine. However, if I change that to a 4K monitor, that's how small the, the icons become. Now I know there, are, there is scaling and things like that, but not all programs scale equally. Some might scale better than others. To give you an idea, <laughs> the PowerPoint I'm using is PowerPoint. 2002. I have to think about it for a second to get it right. PowerPoint 2002. I bought it in 2002. I paid for it. I'm still using it. It still works. Yeah. Can you imagine that scaling? No, nor can I. Okay. So let's move on. Uh, my camera. There are very few things that I actually do with my camera that require um, changes for color. So the two tools I use that maybe are a little bit kind of not standard for a lot of people are my flash meter. We're not covering flash tonight. We're, we're talking about color and my color checker passport. That's it. Those are the kind of the weird tools that I need to actually get my work done. There's a couple of ways I will use it and depends on the scenario. I will do this, the, the color checker passport. Actually, let's, let's just see. I don't know if, if you can. If you can make me bigger on your screen, if you can see me, my color checker passport, there it is. It looks like that. It has like a, a colored side and a couple of gray panels. Whether you can see that or not, I have no idea, but 
you can see it on the little picture with the uh, lovely Chloe. I didn't ask her to do that face. <laughs> That's weird. Uh, so I use that to occasionally get a custom white balance for photography, but always a custom white balance for video because I can change my white balance. We're going to do that in a second. For stills, really easy, really accurately. It's not so easy for videography, and I do a lot of videography. So, yeah, um, that is uh, my kind of go-to for video work. So let's get into the editing bit, because that's really where the rest of the evening is going to go. Uh, if you're a Lightroom user, there's Lightroom for you. That's about all I can tell you about Lightroom. It kind of works. Um, I don't use Lightroom. I'm not a Lightroom user. I can't answer questions about Lightroom, honestly, because it's not my go-to piece of software. But everything I'm going to show you from this point forward, you can do in Lightroom. Absolutely, yes, you can. Are there any questions, Sam? I can see you scribbling things. Tell you one thing. Yes. Um, the yes. I wondered about that. Yeah. Yes. Okay, so uh, you can't hear Sam, but she's just pointed out that the uh, the offer where it said Gavin 10 for the 10 percent off the, um, the the color checker stuff, the uh, the calibration stuff, that's correct. But the BenQ monitors, the offer code should be Gavin 5 because it's 5 percent. I mean, you can try Gavin 10, see if you get 10 percent, but <laughs> I don't think that's going to help. No, it's, that's sad. Okay. <laughs> So uh, this is what I use. Uh, so this is my Calibrite Color Checker Passport. It is absolutely brilliant. Uh, I've had them for years. They used to be called X-Rite. They're now called Calibrite. Different name, same thing, same use. I've used it in corporate world. I've used it in non-corporate world. Uh, I've used it all over the place to try and get my colors from that, which is what the camera said was right through to that which is something that looks a little bit more right and that's what I'm going to show you for the rest of it and hopefully that should be the end of PowerPoint yes it is thank goodness for that so let's just come out of this I need to press a few buttons bear with me and oh, there we go and hopefully find some files yeah there we are we have some, some images to look at okay good so uh, I'm going to take you through how I use it in a whole bunch of different scenarios. So let's open up this image here. So uh, this is a standard image. Ideally, you would shoot your images as raw files. Can't really stress that enough. But let's say you've shot a JPEG, or in this case, a TIFF. Uh, you're then going to just take that into Camera Raw. Or if you're a Lightroom user, you're just going to be in Lightroom. Oh, there's a question, Sam. Yeah. Okay, good question, Jane. Does the card have to fill the frame? No, it doesn't. I will cover that in a little bit. And I say no, it doesn't. It, it, well, it doesn't. But you'll, you'll see. I'm going to show you it not working because I think that's important as well as showing you actually working. But really good question. Uh, okay, so here it is. Let's fill the screen with it so you can see it. As I say, it doesn't have to fill the screen. Uh, you can see there are two sections. There is a top section which has these little gray swatches. And there is a lower section, which we'll get to in a minute, uh, which has a whole bunch of colored swatches. OK, so the gray swatches are here for white balance. The ones of interest are this one here with a little tiny notch and this one here with a little tiny notch. The notches indicate that those two gray swatches are completely neutral gray. You'll notice that the top line has little faces. The bottom line has little mountains. In theory, these are geared towards portraits and landscapes, but trust me, these are only icons. You are safe to ignore that totally, because I do all the time. Okay, so the way it should work is you get your white balance tool, and if you click on the neutral, for example, right there, it's going to neutralize out the colors. Instantly, better colors. Just one click, and that's fixed. If I increase the, the, um, the, if I increase it, well, if I go to the right, and it is increasing, notice there's little pluses that get bigger and bigger, because as I click on the swatches to the right, so it gets warmer and warmer and warmer. You also notice the sun icon gets bigger as well at one end. So there's little subtle hints to what these do. I can go the other way. I can click on the neutral and go colder and colder. 
And between the two, I've got this range of correct white balances, but with a warm or cold shift. Okay, this is the whole image with this was gold. So of course you'd want a gold warm tone. That makes sense. But certainly compared to what the camera shot, if I go back to as shot, you can see just changing the white balance alone makes a vast difference to what the camera thought was the right settings. Okay, so that's how it's supposed to be used. Let's do a few actual kind of use cases, uh, cases, cases where we actually use it. And hang on, we'll just need to pop this up. Yes, there we go. And we'll close that down. So we've got a whole bunch of images here. And I'm gonna go grab this one. So there's a few ways that we can actually do this. So I'm gonna take you through as if I was actually editing a photo. This is a real shoot. This really happens. This is my test shot, which happens either at the beginning or the end, usually of a shoot. And this is Jess. And I wanted a warm tone for this. This was what I thought at the time looked right. Looking at the back of my camera, this looked lovely. Looking at it on my screen, it looks horrendous. It's gone green. So, um, I mean, what was I thinking? My white balance out of camera is, is 11,250. That's nuts. So I've got my color checker passport here. Uh, I can use any of these to get my white balance right. What I would say is if you click, you're gonna be okay. But if you're in Photoshop, click and drag and you'll sample a much larger area and give you a more accurate reading of that gray swatch. Okay, in Lightroom, you just change the, the sample size, but in Photoshop, you just click and drag. So that in theory is the correct uh, white balance. And certainly compared to what I shot, it's, it's very vastly different. But if I wanted it slightly warm, I could probably just increase the warmth a little bit and something like that feels about right. Now, once I've done that, I'll also make some other basic changes. And I mean, very basic, like putting in a bit of noise reduction and then I can click done. Okay, and that's done, finished. If I go back to my images and I open a real image, so now with this image, once it pops on the screen, I want to repeat what I've just done. So I do that here by clicking on the three little spots here in Adobe Camera Raw and choosing apply previous settings. And that will apply the previous settings. I may need to fine tune things a little bit, but my white balance has been set and also it brought across my noise reduction as well. So I use the color checker passport to get my white balance correct for one image. And then I repeat that by, re by just doing the basic, you know, previous adjustment. And then I will make fine tunes like that. Okay, done. And we can do that for one more because well, I have a whole bunch of them. Here we go, we'll do that again. So this is same shoot, again, not quite the right, well, anything on that one, I was way off but I can repeat it. It'll bring the same white balance that I had from my image way back from the color checker passport. It keeps it going as long as you keep the previous settings going and it just works. Really simple, really quick. As shot, white balance, custom white balance. Okay, so that's one way of doing it. Now, if you're a Lightroom user, you don't do that. You have like the, the film strip at the bottom. Uh, hang on one second, let me just press the right buttons at my end. Oops, cancel. Are you sure? Yes, I am. That, that's it. So let's see if we can do something similar to how Lightroom users would see things. So I've got a whole bunch of images here. I'm going to open them into Camera Raw. Uh, should we just show you? I'll show you behind the scenes. Here's a behind the scenes. So this is the, the setup that we had. Lovely Sophie again. And um, yeah, we covered her in twigs out of the garden and some sort of mesh stuff. And she's done this great makeup, but I wanted the whole thing to feel a little bit colder than that. So here are my images. And there we go. And I'll bring all of those into camera raw. So this time, rather than bringing one image in a time, I've brought all three images as a film strip along the bottom of the screen. So all I have to do now is either select all the images now or at the end, it doesn't matter which way you want to do things. And anything I do here, for example, go change the white balance, will get repeated down the line. 
But if I want a cool white balance, I can actually select this little cool white balance here, and that will give me that colder white balance. I can also make my basic changes, like everything is a little bit underexposed for some reason, put my noise reduction in, and all of those things will get repeated on the other images. As long as they are all selected, anything I do to one image becomes repeated on everything else. And now I have nice cool images. And by cool, I mean uh, cool in tone, not cool in yay, aren't I cool? That's definitely not my uh, way of describing things. Go for it, Sam. Well, it is about the previous picture, yeah, the white okay, previous picture, yes. Oh, that's a really good question. Okay, I missed the name, sorry. Nigel. Nigel. So, Nigel, why didn't I just click the dress in the last picture? Well, we can do that here as well. Why don't I just click on this grey? And the simple reason being is it's not exactly uh, accurate. This isn't a colour that is consistent. So if I want a consistent colour, yes, you might get something that looks about right, but then you go and click on another white dress on another day, and then you've lost that consistency. So individual cases, yeah, that might work. I mean, I've done the whites of eyes back in the early days. It's not a good way of doing it at all. If you want consistency of colour, so you want it to be the same on your next shoot, then obviously you need something that you can carry into the next shoot. I suppose if they were wearing the same white dress. We're going to cover that in a bit. So should it be in the shade or the direct sunlight we are getting to? Good question. Okay, so let's come out of that. And uh, I do love the questions. That's great. Thank you very much. Let's go through something else. Uh, right, so uh, that was how to make things a little cooler. Let's open up this image. This is fun because I haven't actually done anything with these images. I've done one image so far out of this entire shoot. Uh, so this is a, a shoot where we were going to do like an ice queen kind of thing. It's a frozen, uh, but that's copyright, so we can't use that as a title. Not frozen, fro yeah. It's a <laughs> so uh, with this shot, what I wanted to do was give everything a cold feel. Now I could come with my uh, little eyedropper tool into the coldest of the greys here, and I can get to that. But if I want to do a really cold, there is a special little icon that I use for really cold feeling shots. Now, this isn't in the manual. I'm going way off script. So, you know, Calibrite aren't going to say this is what you should be doing, but it's my little secret. Okay, so here we go. Let's share this. Down the bottom of the screen, notice that there is a brown and a slightly lighter brown and then a blue color swatch. It's that slightly lighter brown uh, beige, maybe? Uh, I'm going to just drag over that one, and that is going to give my images the cold feel that I'm after. So it's not really blue, it's not really greeny blue, it just feels cold. And that is the one I use. So when I want to have a consistent cold look, that's my go-to look. It's as simple as that, just click on that little beige square there. Similarly, if you want a really warm tone, Try the one next to it. That will give you a really warm tone. Remember when you're sort of color correcting, you get the opposite of what you click on. So if you want something cold, you need to click on something warm because it sort of inverts it in some respect. So that's a warm and that's cold. They're way off the chart of what you should be using, but they're a nice little secret hack. Okay, so that's, that's kind of what I used. Okay, let's close that and not save the changes. Okie dokie. So I did have a go in camera, and uh, in camera, I got it reasonably close. So that was my in camera one, and it's okay, but I definitely prefer my little hack, and I didn't hit the done button, so I can't go back and show you. But that's, that's kind of close. And there's a reason I try and get things roughly right in camera, and it's simply because uh, I have a large orange cable that connects my computer to my camera, because when I'm doing shoots, I use my tether tools cable and my tether tools kit to display the images, which helps me, helps the model, helps anybody in the room understand where I'm going with color, shape, lighting, that kind of thing. Okay, how are we doing on time? Blimey, doesn't time fly quick when you're having fun? 
OK, so um, that's one way of working. There's another way we can use uh, the Color Checker Passport to get even more, even deeper into getting this right. So let's just see if I can bring this up and show you what I've got here. OK, so we're going to go back a few years to when we did workshops. Oh, we can actually have people, groups. I think they're going to start again in 2022. Next year, I think, is the year of the workshop. That's that's kind of my hope. Uh, we did a circus-themed workshop. So much fun. I made everybody on the workshop take this picture as their first shot. Uh, not this face. Um, that was a lovely Beth. And again, I'm not sure I asked Beth to do that. Uh, but uh, to take a picture of the color checker passport. So I knew that everybody could get good colors. Uh, I could just use this just to get the white balance right. But if you really want to use the color checker passport to its fullest, you have to start making color profiles. So how do you do that? Well, the first thing is you need to get a bit of software and you need to get a bit of software, which is called the color checker. Here it is, looks like this. And important is what it says in the middle, drag and drop a DNG image here. All right, what on earth is a DNG image and where do you get one? Right, okay, so my raw files, I'm an Olympus user, an Olympus ambassador, my Olympus raw files are ORF, Olympus raw file, and they are not a DNG. But here in Camera Raw, to get a DNG, I simply click on this little uh, save or convert icon, and it pops up a box on the wrong screen. Hang on, there it is. And I just tell it to save it as a DNG. Where do I want to save it? Well, exactly where it is now, thank you very much. Hit the Save button. Yep, that's it, done. Cancel that. And if I go back to my bridge, here we go, I now have an extra file that is the same one, but with DNG written on it. So now I can drag that, drop that, into the camera checker calibration, which I should make nice and big. Wait patiently, which is the hard bit, especially when you're live, because, yeah, go on then, ask me a question. Yes, Kenneth. It did it. Oh, my raw file. Did you know, and you know why that is? That's because this is my laptop though. Okay, oh yes, yeah, they can't hear you. I forgot you haven't got a microphone. Yes, um, I will change that in a second. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. It should say sRGB. Uh, we're using my laptop, which is not what I normally edit on, not surprisingly, and I've had to install a whole bunch of things to make this work this evening, and one of them is Photoshop, and I haven't changed that. Kenneth, good man, good spot. So um, I'll change that in a second, but to make a, uh, a calibrated file, here it is. I literally dropped it on. I didn't do anything else because I was talking and not looking at the screen because luckily it's all automated. But if I zoom out, you can kind of see what it does. It automatically finds the little color swatches down here. And that's it. You click on create profile, give it a name. Quick tip, it can take a minute or two to actually create a profile. So in the best Blue Peter fashion, I've already done it. Um, and that's basically it. Yes, that is a very good question, Mark. I, I will show you in a second. It is very much camera specific. Okay, so the profiles you, well, let's show you. It's easier to show you. Okay, so that's done. Let's uh, come out of that. So once you've done that, you can then jump into an image. Let's go for an actual final image because time's ticking along. Okay, an actual final image. Here we go. And apply your color profile. So at the moment, it gets the default Adobe color. I'm going to come down here to Browse and then Profiles. And here it is. Here's my circus color profile that I created. And if I just put my mouse over it, I don't know. Can you spot the difference? All I've done is make a color profile, get the very most out of that raw file by saying, look, Adobe doesn't know my raw file. It doesn't really understand what's going on. The difference is vast absolutely vast not a touch of editing has happened i haven't even got to the editing stage and hopefully you can see just how much of an improvement or a difference that makes to the the colors within that picture they absolutely blast off the screen not surprisingly reds are the biggest difference which is because i love reds and it just seems to make a massive difference when you apply a color profile um, so yeah uh, there are other color profiles in here 
but this is the only color profile for an Olympus EM1 Mark II. So this is the only profile it's showing me. Okay, so to answer Mark's question. Okay, that's that. Uh, time's ticking on, so I need to press on. Uh, some questions we had earlier. So um, how should you light it? Always make sure that you light your color checker passport in the same light that you're lighting your subject and try and make sure that it's not, not underexposed, not tilted away, tilt it towards the light. So it just looks nice and bright and, and sort of clean and bright. Uh, try not to underexpose it. Try to get your exposure right. You'll notice that I've focused on the color checker passport and not the model. This isn't a picture of the model, it's a picture of the color checker passport. But what happens if the opposite happens? I've got what I auto detect on and it's detected the eyes. Hmm, okay. Can you still get this to work? Okay, well, let's find out. Let's get a blurry one and throw that into our color checker passport. There's the blurry one. Here we go, blurred. I've already made it a DNG file. I've cheated a bit because I knew I'd waffle on too much. So I've already saved this out as a DNG. Here we go. There it is. It worked. And at that point, you can be confident that that's worked. The minute you see the little squares pop up, you can say, yep, that absolutely fine. No problems at all. That has worked, even though it's not actually in focus. OK, what if it's really, really blurry? Let's get this one and bring this one in. So this one is really, really blurry. Let's make it nice and big so you can see it. Again, we have to wait for it to load the image. It'll load the image in. What was a question? Yep, yeah, go for it. Hi, Jane, yeah. OK, so uh, when would I use a profile? When color is absolutely critical. So if it's a color critical item, so you're doing product photography, perfect example, uh, where you ha want to ha have the absolute maximum of your colors. So if your image is really colorful, run a profile. You'll still need to do white balance. Your profile will not fix your white balance. That's two separate things. Don't get them muddled up. But uh, yeah, those are the main things, whenever color is critical or whether a color is punchy. Um, you don't have to, it's, you know, but it, it's there. OK, so what happened here? Auto cropping error. Color checker could not detect blah, 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 blah. OK, so it didn't work because this is super blurry. Does that mean it's a disaster? No, it's not a disaster at all, because I can actually click here where I know it is, like that. There we are. And then I can zoom in a little bit. And we're pushing the boundaries of what this is designed to do. But if I can put these little green squares over the color checker passport, I can create a profile. Is it going to be the best profile? <clears throat> Maybe not, but it'll work. OK, so I can still create a profile, even if it is a two second exposure. And I forgot I'm handheld, handhelding. No, hand holding for two seconds. OK, so uh, yeah, that was um, these are all my real photos. I haven't taken these for demonstration purposes. It's rather embarrassing, isn't it? But there we go. Uh, oh, that was arty. OK, somebody asked earlier, does it need to fill the screen? So let's grab one where it doesn't fill the screen and bring that in. Where is it? It is this one. Uh, here we go. So this is one of those ones. Again, my my shot. I was looking at the the bigger picture and completely forgot what I'm doing because you get wrapped up in the moment. Uh, oh, no, look, color checker passport can't detect the image. You can manually identify. I could, but I think this is probably too small. OK, so I could manually go in and put the spots in, but I think that's probably pushing my luck. What I would do in this case is actually take another photo which is exactly what I did. I was like, no, what am I doing? What a fool. Hang on a minute. Let's just take another photo like that. And it's at that moment you realize what you've actually done, actually, no, it was later, is you photograph the color checker upside down. So this is an upside down color checker. Will that work? OK, let's go find out. Let's bring it in, find out will it work. Does it have to be the right way up? We know it doesn't have to be perfectly in focus. But does it matter if you put it upside down? It's quite tense now, isn't it? 
No, it doesn't matter at all. It's found it. It's absolutely fine. It worked out that it's upside down and it just took that into account. You see, it's like the, the people thought when they built the software, you know what? Photographers are human beings and they're going to make mistakes. And they kind of took that into account. So, uh, yeah. On those notes, yes. Oh, yes. Okay, John, that is a really good point. So John asks, should, uh, should you say to the model, don't touch the swatches? You'll notice when my models are holding it, none of them have got their fingers in front of the, uh, the swatches. Um, they're all holding it at the sides or at the back where it's safe to do so. Because yeah, these color swatches, there's a reason why these things don't cost a few pounds, they cost a few tens of pounds and then some, is because these things are accurate calibration tools and they need to be treated like that. I don't treat mine like that. I treat mine really badly, which is why I've got three of them from the last, oh God, it's not near how many years I've had them now, eight years probably, uh, because they get beaten up and, and destroyed. But yeah, tell your models, don't touch the front. It is not a makeup palette. They look like eyeshadow. They look, <laughs> I don't know. Sam says they look like eyeshadow. I yeah. wouldn't know. <laughs> okay, so yes, it does work if it's upside down. So that should answer a few questions like that. All right, so we have 10 minutes to go. We are. I'm not going to get time for the live photography, but we are going to get time for live edit. And um, yeah, that's that's kind of, we'll, we'll have to come back and do another live photography one another night. So I'm going to take you through the whole workflow of, of kind of, well, let's just go through it. Let's open an image up and have a little look at an edit. Um, so here we go. This is a shot taken right here in my small home studio. I hung every piece of black fabric I own up on the wall to give me this, this black uh, wall of, of darkness. I had a strip box off to the side. I had my model moving from right to left, took about two seconds of exposure. A very strong ambient light, so the model is recorded moving but blurred, and then a flash of light at the end to give us that freezing shot. Not surprisingly, the model is wearing red. Fabulous. But the colors don't look right. The, the reds, these are not the reds that I was expecting. It's more orange, skin tones look a little bit kind of yellowy. All in all, not quite where I want to be. So let's go grab an image. Here we go, let's grab this one. So this is my calibration image, Oh, which is super blurry. Uh, that's okay. There should have been a sharp one in here as well. Damn it. Oh, well, that's right. We'll go with the flow. That's fine. And it's too late to change it now because it's on my other computer. There is a sharp version of this image. Uh, nonetheless, I'm going to go and grab a white balance because although I can't make a, a profile off of this, I, can, I could. I can make a profile off of this. I can do this. I can do this. I'm going to make this work for you, Internet. I'm not giving in. OK, here we go. I'm not going to be beaten by my own inability to get things where they should be at the right time. Um, here we go, let's bring this in. We've got seven minutes, I can do this in seven. Easy, if you've got a question, I tell you what, now is a great time to stick it in the comments, it really is. Okay, so uh, yes, I know it can't do that. I, I was there earlier, let's make our own little profile. We'll go click, 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 there we go. Let's zoom in a little bit. So this is real world stuff. This is the joy of going live, because if this was a video, all this would be edited out. Uh, but this is reality. Let's bring that across. There we go. So that is pretty good. I will create my profile. Here we go. Create my profile, and we're going to call this dancer. Okay, save. Okay, now this is going to take about a minute, 90 seconds, something like that. It varies from computer to computer and from moment to moment. And uh, when you're sat on a live, it seems like forever. Sadly, the little orange thing doesn't get to the end and stop. If I had one, one kind of request to, to calibrate for the next version of this is, can you make that little orange thing move at the speed of actual real time? Because um, that would be really, really useful. But little, little insider tip, if it's going really slowly, if you click and drag the orange slider along, it doesn't do anything. Sadly, it doesn't speed it up, but you know, it gives you something to do. Has it? Oh, good. I'm glad someone's been noting this. I haven't been looking at the uh, chat or the comments at all. Uh, that's 
that's good. There's nothing for me to. Uh, that's good because it actually isn't appearing on my screen. <laughs> I'm glad you're on there, Sam. Well done. Okay, so that's going to take a moment. It's getting there. It will get there. And this is way longer than usual because it's live. That's what happens when you go live. OK, I'm going to bail on that one and go back to my images because I don't want everybody just to sit there waiting and watching a little orange slider go along. So let's open up the, the image. OK, and we'll make a few edits. So first thing I'm going to do is maybe just fix my brightness overall because I'd like it just a little bit brighter. And then we're going to remove some of the distractions. So I'm going to get my graduated filter. I'm going to set my graduated filter to, well, basically all the exposure, all the highlights, all the shadows, all the whites and all the blacks gone, everything to minus their maximum. And then I can just drag out. There we are. Look at that. That has now uh, removed that whole softbox from the side of the shot. Brilliant. OK, that worked very nicely. Uh, let's make another one down here. Doesn't need quite so much strength on that. So we can maybe just bring some of those back again like that. OK, and we'll do a third one just on the floor, just to tweak the floor a little bit as well. And again, that doesn't need quite so much strength. Definitely not so much blacks. OK, so uh, I've got my, my basic editing about right. Let's just jump into the noise reduction and apply some noise reduction. That looks pretty good. Let's just go have a little look and see whether it's, no, it's still going because I'm live. Yeah. OK, so rather than using the one I've just made, we're going to kind of cheat a little bit. I'll use one that I've got existing in here already. Here's, here's one I prepared earlier, Sam's so saying. It's not quite, but it's pretty close. So I'm going to come down to my profile. I'm going to choose browse and I'm going to come down here. So, oh, yeah, I did make one earlier. You're right. <laughs> I actually made one earlier. I remember now I did do I did some preparation. <laughs> OK, so you'll notice the one that said circus isn't here. And it's not here because this is a different camera. This is the Mark three where the other was the Mark two. So the profiles are specific to the cameras that you are using. Uh, but I did actually do a profile for this. There it is. And you can see the difference. If I sort of hover over it, the reds now look continuous. The reds are the same where it's red and orange. And it's I mean, it's OK. But that's really what I wanted. That is a much, much better red and orange. That's excellent. So I can do that. And that should give me the, the colors that I'm after, the much, much brighter colors. What I should have done, of course, was do my white balance. Let's do that as well. Let's click on done. There's a question. Go for it, Sam. Yeah. Um, Hello, Michael. Yes, I'm going to say it, it's the, the place to start is always you're going to be a monitor. So if, you, if your colors are adrift, start with the thing you're looking at, because the monitor is, I mean, monitors and prints trying to get them to match is honestly a, a, a dark art. I, I tried for many years and um, kind of accepted there, there was never a perfect match. That was years ago. Things are definitely better. Uh, but the Calibrite staff are, are fantastic. Reach out to them. Uh, they have years of experience in that and can uh, point you in the right direction of the tools and the techniques that you need. I'm not your guy for that. Uh, sorry, that's that's just me. Uh, okay, done. Okay, done. So where were we? Minus five and that one. So I'm just going to open up my image. Uh, hey, there you go. It did it eventually get there. That's kind of it. That's really, really nice. Uh, I'm kind of glad it did get there in the end. Okay, so let's open up my final image. And uh, if I want to put that in, I can just copy and paste those in, minus 15. And there you go. That should be my roughly right colors. Mm. Hello. I'm going to go back to our shot. That's better. Yeah, that's better. I'm trying to do things back to front, and I'm making a right mess of it. So I'm going to stick with that bit right there. My biggest change by far, getting my color profile right. That's 
when you've got punchy color, that's the thing to sort out. And because somebody pulled me up on it earlier, uh, I'm gonna show you how to change your color space, which is the little bit at the bottom down here, which pops up on the wrong screen. And we'll change that to sRGB. Not gonna make any major changes here. It's just gonna affect the image when I save it out. It's gonna save it as an sRGB workflow, which is how I work. There you go, that brings us around to the top of the hour. Uh, yeah, are there any other questions? Anything else I should know? We're good to go, fantastic. Let's throw that onto the screen. Uh, let's see if we can, can we change this? Hang on a second, there was an update. Uh, yeah, there we are, look at that. Got it right. So there are some special offers. Uh, just to remind you, thank you very much to both BenQ and Calibrite for arranging for some special offers for the viewers here. 10% uh, off using Gavin10 on the calibrators from Calibrite. 5% off BenQ by using the code Gavin5. That's Gavin5. Um, yep, from, yeah, you have to go through Color Confidence's website, uh, www.colorconfidence.com. And that is valid for the next seven days till the 24th uh, of this month. Uh, so huge thanks to them for doing that offer and for putting this on. And this isn't the only event that Calibrite have got coming up. Um, so stick around. There are more stuff coming up. Um, keep tuned into their social media channels. I don't know what's coming up, but hopefully uh, I'll be back doing some more stuff soon. Uh, Sam, anything I should know? We're all good? Fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to stop sharing my screen just for a second, just so you guys can see me. There I am. I'm back. So thank you very much for tuning in. These sessions are great fun, but what really makes a difference is you joining me, asking questions. Honestly, that really makes it quite exciting and dynamic. I'd like to thank Sam for being just out of screen and doing awesome work. Uh, they'll get the recording of this tomorrow. Very efficient. Um, so thanks to uh, Calibrite and BenQ for making it happen. Thanks for watching. I'm Gavin Hoey. Thanks for watching.